Hello, my elegant warriors. Hello, those of you listening on the podcast or and or those of you watching here on YouTube. Today, I am going to talk to you about one of my favorite topics. It's a topic that we have tapped into a number of times on the podcast, but today we are diving deep and that topic is delight. And the reason I am diving in deep is because a few episodes ago, I did an episode called With Delight or Not at All. And I had tons of questions about how to get into that feeling of delight. So next week, I'm going to do an episode on how to get into delight. But today, I want to talk to you about why. Because without the why, you will not invest in the how. You know, without knowing why delight is so important and delight works and delight is imperative if you are going to get all of the things that you want. But without knowing all of that and really believing in the power of delight, you won't invest the time, the money, the resources, the energy in doing the how. So today it's all about why. And my obsession with delight is deep. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I describe advocating as knowing what you want, asking for it out loud and with delight and mastering the art of the ask. And then a few weeks ago, I talked about doing everything in your life with delight or not at all. Yesterday, I coached a woman and she had to set a boundary and we worked on setting the boundary with delight. I know that delight is everything when it comes to persuasion and influence and getting what you want. And so today I want to talk to you about why delight is so important. And we want to start with that word. I'm obsessed with words. Words have energy and they have meaning. I've always known that. If you're a longtime listener, you know I've been obsessed with the origin of words. I have an app on my phone that will give me the root of a word because I know that words have magic. I know that words have energy and impact on us and our nervous systems and our subconscious. And now that I've studied hypnosis, I know that even more deeply. I'm even more sure of that. And words have even more importance, if that's possible, than they used to. So this word delight, what does it even mean? The definition of delight is great pleasure. So if someone does something with delight, they do it with great pleasure. But if you go to the root of the word delight, it is charm, charming. And that is what is really necessary for you to persuade and influence. It is what is really necessary for you to ask for what you want and get it. And it's what's necessary for you to set effective boundaries. And therefore, once you can persuade and influence and set good boundaries, you can make more money. You can get the jobs that you want. You can get the resources, the opportunities, the time, the health, all of the things come from delight. Now, delight is a little bit different than joy. I talked to someone the other day who wanted to coach with me and we were talking about this topic and she kept referencing that she wanted to be joyful all the time. That's not the same as delight. Joy is a high bar. And while I encourage you to reach for that bar, of course, delight is not quite the same. Delight is great pleasure. Delight is charm. Those things are accessible to you even when joy does not feel accessible to you. And so we want to really focus today on why delight is so important and why it's sort of different than some of these other things you may be reaching for. So I'm going to share three reasons why delight is so powerful. The first reason that delight is so powerful and something that you really want to focus on in your life is because delight changes the room. Delight is contagious. Now, when I say delight's contagious, it doesn't mean that the people around you are going to feel delight just because you do. What it means is that it changes the energy in the room. Just like if I have a cold and I walk into a room, not everyone in the room will catch a cold. Everyone will be exposed to the delight that I feel, and it will change the energy in a room. So there's lots of research that backs this up. There are studies that show, and I, I'm going to put a link to the studies all about the energy and the contagiousness of energy in the show notes or below you if you're watching on YouTube. But there are studies that show that we smile back when people smile at us because we want to align with the emotions of the other people in our lives. There's also studies that show that humans align with the emotional states that they perceive. We are constantly doing this. 
consciously and more often subconsciously. And so we want to be delightful, bring delight to a room to change the energy of the room. I saw this, it's a, it's a story I have told on my social media before, but it's one that bears repeating here. And I actually told it a long time ago because it happened a long time ago, but man, I will never forget it. Thankfully, on this particular day, I started off in delight and I have worked hard to do that. I have a lot of things that I do that we're going to discuss in the how that get me to a place of delight, not joy all the time, but delight, great pleasure, feeling charmed by life, feeling charming. And so I had started this particular day in delight, which was a good thing because a lot of things happened that could have taken me out of that delight. I needed to mail something and it had to be through DHL because of the recipient, long story. So I went to the first DHL outpost and it was a weekday, shouldn't have been a problem, but that DHL was closed. I was hell bent on getting this thing done that morning. I don't like to take weekdays to do these types of errands. So I had set aside this time and it was going to happen. So I Googled another place that I could go for DHL and I found this other place. I drove to the place and when I pulled up and saw that it was actually open, I was delighted. I was very pleased that I was going to have the opportunity to get into this DHL and send this thing off. And I went in and there was a man behind the counter who did not seem very delighted with his job, but that happens, no problem. And so I went up to the wall and I started to look at sort of the instructions and I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do next. So I asked him, I need to mail this thing and I wanna do it through DHL. And he pointed at the wall and there was like all these package types on the wall, you know, like uh, a envelope was there, a couple of boxes. And he's like, you need one of those. And so I went over and touched the one that I thought he had pointed at, which in retrospect would not have worked, but I touched that one and I said like this, and he said, no, it's never going to fit in that, that very unhappy with me. And then he said, what are you stupid? And I could have chosen a whole lot of emotions in response to his asking me if I was stupid. I could have gotten mad. I could have gotten frustrated. I could have gotten angry. I could have been aggressive. I could have gone into lawyer mode and start cross-examining him and explain to him that his legal obligation was to help me as the customer. There's a lot of things that I could have chosen in that moment, but I immediately had the belief that something must have happened to this man that day that something must be wrong with him. No one responds that way to another human being if everything is good in their lives. And so instead of lowering to his vibration of anger, frustration, impatience, almost disgust, I responded to him with delight. And I said to him, I am so sorry. You are the expert. That's why I'm here. I don't know anything about shipping. I don't know anything about boxes. I don't know anything about packing up this particular electronic thing. I need your help because you are the expert. Can you explain to me what I'm supposed to do? And he looked at me funny and then talked me through the process, got me the right box. We got the thing packed up. We got it mailed away. And we did all of that in silence. But I remained in delight and curiosity about him. I was wondering what could have happened to have made him so angry that morning and what could be happening in his life that would lead to such a low vibration coming from him. And as I packed up, I paid him all again in silence. As I packed up, he said to me, I'm sorry about earlier. And I said, oh, it's okay. And, you know, just kind of tried to keep it moving. And he said, no, listen, I'm really sorry. And I'll never forget it because I knew leaving that store that I had changed the energy in that room. I did not know walking in in my sort of fog of delight that he was in a bad place, but immediately it was very obvious to me in the way that he responded to me. And then by the end of our interaction, I knew that I had changed the energy in that room. I love this Wayne Dyer used to, um, he was one of my favorites, one of, remains one of my favorite authors, but really one of my favorite teachers. And I remember him telling a story. He was a tennis player and he played tennis for fun and he was playing tennis and doubles. 
And one of the people on the other side was like yelling and screaming and acting crazy with his partner. And Wayne went and just stood near them during one of the breaks in between sets and stood near them with the deliberate intent to raise the energy vibration on that tennis court. And he did. They acted a little bit differently. That man who had been yelling and screaming and acting out of sorts acted differently after Wayne had deliberately changed the energy in that space. When you bring delight into a room, you change the energy in that room. And that is good for you. It's good for the other people in the room. It's good for anyone who's coming into the room later. And it's good for you the rest of the day. So the first thing that's powerful about delight is that delight changes the energy in a room. And it is really powerful to know that you have the power to do that, especially if you are a leader or a salesperson or a parent or a teacher or a surgeon. Think about what you can do if you can walk into a room and change the energy of that room. You can do it when you walk into that room with delight. So the first reason that you want to learn to do things with delight is because you then change the energy in a room and that is enormously powerful. The next reason that delight is so important is that delight is better than gratitude. Hear me out. I know gratitude is a huge thing. Gratitude has an amazing PR agent. Gratitude has, you know, Oprah talked a lot about it when she had her show. And I feel like that is sort of what led the groundswell behind this idea that we have to be grateful and we need gratitude journals. And there's been all kinds of research, beautiful research, which I will link to, that says that gratitude is enormously powerful in the in changing your day, changing your mood reducing depression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, of course, I'm a big fan of gratitude. I am so grateful for so many things in my life, for sure. And there's a couple of things about gratitude that I think we don't talk about enough. One is that sometimes it feels as though when we are grateful for things, it's almost as if we risk losing them. I talk to a lot of people who feel this way, that when they're in gratitude, all of a sudden the emotion is fear or apprehension that this thing that I'm grateful for is going to go away. And I don't know where that click is, but I know it exists for me and I know that it exists for some others as well. I once remember Brene Brown talking about standing over a sleeping baby's crib and feeling so grateful to have this child and then immediately having this fear that the child would, something would happen to the child. And I think that sometimes happens with gratitude. I don't know the reason. If any of you watching or listening know the reason, please DM me. Um, I'm an elegant warrior on Instagram, or you can send me an email, heather at elegantwarrior.com. I would love to know more about this, but I know it is a real thing. So that's the number one reason that gratitude can be a little bit mm, not so fun. The other thing about it is delight is more fun to me than gratitude is. And I'll give you a perfect example. The There's a saying, and I'm going to maul it a little bit, but you'll get the gist. There's a saying that I used to be upset that I had no shoes and then I met a man who had no feet. And I appreciate that saying. And it's this idea that we should be grateful that we have feet instead of being sad that we don't have shoes. But I actually think that delight goes beyond gratitude. So this idea that, oh, I should be grateful that I have feet, that's fine, but I should delight in my feet. I should dance with my feet. I should run with my feet. I should swim with my feet. I should play with my feet because I have them. And I think that the universe wants us to go beyond gratitude, which feels sort of like, you know, thank you, may I have another, to celebrating, delighting in the things that we're grateful for, delighting in our feet and using them to celebrate, delighting in the things that we want, the things that we're asking for, the things that we're going for, the things that we have, truly delighting in them. It is a higher energy than gratitude, and it gets you into so much more creativity and curiosity and fun. And the power of that is huge. I'll give you another example. I read a book about gratitude called The Magic. 
it's by um, Rhonda. I'm going to forget her last name. So I'm going to write it down so I can put it in the show notes. She's the main author of The Secret. And she's written some other books that sort of follow along with The Secret. And The Magic is all about gratitude. And it's a beautiful book. I just in my head substituted delight for gratitude in a lot of places. And one of the places is something that really showed me the difference between gratitude and delight. So in the book, she gives this suggestion that you put a magic rock next to your bed. And I have this beautiful orange crystal that was in my crystal bag. And I took that out and decided that this was going to be my magic rock. And she describes it that you take this magic rock and before you go to bed every night, you hold it in your hand and you think of one thing from that day that you are grateful for. And then you go to bed. And I decided instead to hold that rock in my hand and to think of one thing that was delightful, that I delighted in that day. And there was a difference. The first few days I did it, I actually compared, okay, what am I grateful for? What did I delight in? And one perfect example was on one particular day, at the end of the day, I had uh, brought on a new client to work with me. And I was so grateful for this client. I really was and am. It's a perfect fit client. I know I can help this group. They know I can help them as well. They're so excited to work with me. They're so excited to learn the tools that I teach to build beliefs and they want their people to have hypnosis as well. It is a beautiful, beautiful fit. And I was so grateful for sure. And I was delighting in that client for sure. And if I was going to bed with that magic rock, the thing I was most grateful for that day was that client. But then I wanted to instead say, what, am, what was the most delightful thing of the day? What was the most delightful moment? What am I delighting in today? And that day, the most delightful thing for me was <laughs> I was walking the dog and a swallow like dive bombed the dog which was not delightful. He was scared and not too scared though. He was more curious. But then I started for the dog's benefit, sort of yelling at the swallow, but like sort of kidding. And then the swallow started dive bombing me, which cracked me up for some reason. And then I was like chasing the swallow. It was chasing me. It felt like we were playing a game out on the boardwalk over in Jersey city. Anyone watching would have thought that I was quite insane, which also I found to be delightful. It made me laugh. I was playful. It was fun. It was joyful. It was pleasing. And that was my delightful moment of the day. It's just a different energy than gratitude. I will delight in this client. I will delight in our interactions. I am positive that at the end of some of my days, my delightful moment with my rock is going to be something that happened with one of the people on this team. But that particular day, the thing I was grateful for was not as much fun or pleasing or high energy than frolicking with a swallow on the morning walk with the dog. There's a difference between gratitude and delight. And in my experience and the experience of the people I work with one-on-one -on -one and on teams and in the academy, delight brings more energy, brings more success, brings more affluence, more abundance, all of the things that we want to get when we are belief builders. So as I said, the first thing about delight is that it changes the room. The second thing is that it's even stronger than gratitude. And the third reason that you want to focus on delight is that is how you get what you want. Full stop. The example with the DHL, if I had not been in delight, that man would not have helped me to the extent that he did. I may not have even finished the interaction because I could have gotten angry and fussy and hussy and left. And so I got what I wanted in that DHL store because I stayed in a, in a real energy of delight. And when I tell people one of the keys of getting what you want, asking for what you want and getting it is asking out loud and with delight, it is so important. If I don't ask with delight, I don't receive as much. 
It was true in the courtroom. At the end of my trials, I would ask the jury to give me a verdict and I would do it with delight in full belief that them giving me a win was the right thing for me and my client and them, that it was the right thing as far as the evidence was concerned, that my belief was so strong and I had given them the story and the evidence and the things that they needed for their belief to be so strong, that it was time for them to give me what I wanted and that I could ask with delight and they could do it with delight. If I asked with resentment or fear or frustration or doubt, I did not, I mean, I never did that, but had I done that, I would not have won as many cases as I did. I would not have had the successes that I did. Now, when I am asking someone if they want to work with me, when I am asking someone for resources or to join my team or to um, affiliate with me, if I, if I can't do it with delight, as I said in one of the past episodes, I try not to do it at all because delight is what gets you what you want. A perfect example that I've probably shared here before, but it's worth repeating, is one of my cases, I represented an orthopedic surgeon who had been sued. When they are sued, any doctor, they are frustrated, they are angry, they are confused, they are afraid, they are not in delight. And that is a big hurdle for me to overcome at trial and at deposition. Depositions happen before trial. Depositions are when opposing counsel come and sit down with us and ask questions of the doctor that are then used against the doctor at trial. And I was taking this particular doctor who had never been sued before, who was very, very angry about being sued through his first deposition. And I had encouraged him to be, and I never said the word delight because that would have been too much of a stretch for him, but I had encouraged him to be calm, to be um, even-minded, even-handed, to be civil if he couldn't be friendly. I had encouraged him to do all of those things and they he was just not able to do it. And so at his deposition, he was angry, he was aggressive, he was defensive, his energy was really not great. Uh, the deposition did not go well at all. And that case ultimately went to trial and um, we ultimately won at trial, but only because that doctor had a huge eureka moment between the deposition and the trial. And the eureka moment happened a few months later. So after that deposition where he was not in delight or anywhere close to it, he was angry, frustrated, aggressive, defensive, a lot of things that were the opposite of delight, he got sued again. And I knew why he had been sued again. I know that a lot of patients, attorneys, plaintiffs, attorneys have a listserv, a, a group where they share information about doctors and hospitals and defendants and defense counsel. I know this because I have enough friends on that side that they have told me this. And I know that the attorney in the deposition where my client was so negative shared that experience with this group of attorneys. Now this group of attorneys, if they get a case that they see this doctor is a, could be a defendant in, they're more inclined to dig deep for reasons to sue the doctor because they know the doctor is going to make a terrible witness. And so that is what happened in my opinion. Soon after that deposition, the doctor got named in two more lawsuits. This had nothing to do with the medicine in those lawsuits. It had to do with the fact that they believed that they could get the doctor riled up enough at his deposition that they could make a case against him. And so two more cases came right away. Now my doctor is even more mad, even more frustrated, even more defensive, even more aggressive. And we go to prepare for his next deposition, his second deposition, and I begged him to try something. I begged him to find a way to think about this differently, to find a way to believe differently so that we could get him to what in my mind was going to be delight. I still didn't use that word with him because words have meaning and import and weight and energy. And he wasn't ready to be told that he should be delighted about this circumstance. But I wanted him to look at this situation differently so that I could get him to delight. And next week, we're gonna talk about the how of delight for you. For him, I offered him a new belief about this deposition. I offered him the belief that this deposition was going to be used in front of the jury to teach them about the medicine that he had used in this case. 
I offered him the belief that he could look at the plaintiff's attorney, the patient's attorney, not as the enemy, not as the aggressor, not as the bad guy, not as the bottom feeder and all of the things he had described this person as being, but as a student, as a resident. He, my doctor often taught residents how to do the procedure that was at issue in this case. And I begged him to do the work, to tell himself the story that he was teaching the jury through this deposition, that he was teaching the jury about this medicine as if the jury was a group of residents. And he promised me that he would do that work. And as we prepared for the deposition, yes, we went through the medical records and what he did and why he did it and his training and all of the things. And we kept talking about seeing this deposition as an opportunity to teach because I knew this doctor delighted in teaching. It was one of his favorite things. And so at this next deposition, it was like it was a new person. He was charming. He was delightful. He was delighted to share why he did what he did and what he did and how he did it with this jury through the means of this deposition. And the other attorney on the other side was charmed by him was delighted by him. And it became a conversation all about the procedure. And it was a beautiful thing to watch. But the best part, and this doesn't always happen, in fact, it rarely happens, but the best part was about two weeks after his deposition, I got a phone call from the attorney on the other side who said he was dropping the case against my doctor. The truth of the matter is the case had been weak to start with and probably only taken because this attorney thought that he could trip up my doctor with his anger and his frustration into saying something that hurt him enough that he could pursue the case. And that's not what happened. That delight got my doctor what he wanted, which is to not have been named in this suit, to be dropped from the suit. And it got me what I wanted because then at trial, this doctor had enough evidence of the power of delight to get him what he wanted, that he was able to tap into that delight at trial and we won that case. Delight gets you what you want. If you wanna make more money, you need to learn to do what you do, to ask for clients and customers and your team to follow your lead with delight. If you want more time, you need to ask the people around you to do things for you with delight. You want more resources, you want more opportunities, you want even better health. You've got to ask for help so that you can work out and make better meals and eat better meals at home and not bring sugar into the house. You've got to ask with delight. Ask out loud and with delight. That is what gets you what you want every single day time without hesitation. Sometimes there are blocks to your delight that are subconscious. That's where hypnosis comes in. That's where the work I do in hypnosis comes in. I'm going to put a link in the show notes and below to the wait list for my hypnosis. You want, you'll want. you also get some secrets about hypnosis that you may not have known. A lot of people have the wrong idea about hypnosis in general. So if you're interested, if you're thinking to yourself right now, I believe in the power of delight. I believe that it is enormously important for me to be in it. And I know that there's something blocking me. Hypnosis may be the answer and you wanna get on that wait list. There'll be the link below. And next week I'm gonna dive into how to get into delight. But most fun, most delightful, most importantly, on October 3rd, I am going to do a live masterclass on how to persuade and influence with delight. It's going to be taking the why of delight that you've learned today, the how of delight that you'll learn next week, and wrapping it up in very specific tools so that you can ask for what you want and get it from your bosses, your colleagues, your teams, your prospects, your clients, your investors, your students, your children, your partner, anyone around you. We are going to dive in. It is live, it is free, it is an hour. If you can't make it on October 3rd at noon, you will get a replay. The link to register for that is in the show notes. It's below you if you're watching on YouTube. I, If you can find a way to recognize and appreciate 
the power of delight, you are on your way to success. If you can find a way to tap into delight, you become charming, you become charismatic, you become powerful without being aggressive and nasty and, and angry and any of the things that you may have believed you had to be in order to get what you want. Next week, I will dive into the how of delight, but you're not going to do the how if you don't believe in the why. The why, to round us up, the first thing is it changes the energy in the room. Delight has that power. Second thing, it is even more powerful than gratitude. Delight has an enormous amount of power and potency. And the third thing is delight is the key to asking for what you want and getting it. Next week, we'll talk about how. I'm always available. You can DM me at an elegant warrior on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. And you can email me directly, heather at elegantwarrior.com. I look forward to diving into how with you next week. I really look forward to seeing you at the masterclass live on October 3rd at noon. If you can't be there live, we will send you the replay. You are going to learn how to persuade and influence with delight so that no matter where you go or who you're talking to, you can ask for what you want and get it time and time again. I will talk to you next week, if not sooner. In the meantime, take care good care.